A lot of people these days are retrofitting their old homes with insulation, but insulating the wrong way can actually lead to massive moisture problems like mold and rot. In this video, we're talking about how to insulate an old home in a cold climate, as well as how to address common sources of moisture and show you some strategies that you can use to keep your old home dry and durable for another 100 years. This is going to be a little bit of a longer video, so get comfortable and let's get into it. In this building section, we have a fairly typical historic home that you'd find in the Northeast. We have a masonry basement foundation that bears on stone footings and rubble with a concrete slab. We have some timber framing that bears directly on the concrete and on the masonry with no capillary break. And then we have a wood framed main floor and a framed attic with cedar shake shingles and that pretty much makes up the assembly. On the walls and the roof we have board sheathing rather than plywood or OSB because it hadn't been invented at the time or just wasn't widely available in the case of plywood. And the walls and roof assemblies are uninsulated or minimally insulated so this would be something that you'd see in homes that were built before 1900. Maybe 1900 would be the cutoff date. So this entire space is sort of treated as part of the conditioned space. You might have a furnace or heater down here in the basement area, and that furnace and ductwork distributes heat all around the building so that the basement is part of the conditioned space, obviously the main floor is part of the conditioned space, and the attic is located within the conditioned space. We don't really have issues with condensation because we're constantly drying out these components with all this heat flow due to the uninsulated walls and roof structure, and single pane windows sort of acted like rudimentary dehumidifiers, which help to save the building from moisture damage. We also have a lot of old growth lumber in these assemblies, which allow them to absorb and store a lot more water without failing. And this lumber is denser and has a significantly higher resin content, which means that it's also more resistant to mold and rot fungi. So there's a lot of durability benefits to these older uninsulated buildings. However, because these older uninsulated assemblies were much more resistant to moisture, they do tend to hide small leaks, which can become big problems if we go to retrofit these buildings with insulation. Remember, insulation slows heat flow. You need heat flow or energy for drying to occur. If we start to insulate these older homes haphazardly, we tend to run into some problems because we're changing the moisture dynamics. If we reduce the heat flow, we reduce the drying potential. Another thing that we need to take into account is that we get a lot of moisture flow from these masonry walls into the wood framing because there's no capillary break between the masonry and the wood framing, which means that the wood framing might be okay now, but if we went to go and insulate the rim joist or the framing connection right here, it could hold on to a lot more moisture over time and end up supporting mold and rot, which means it's going to end up deteriorating a lot quicker than if we were to leave it uninsulated. We also get a lot of moisture flow from the soils that dries out to the interior, also due to a lack of a capillary break, and for the most part it's alright until we go to insulate because it can end up trapping a lot more moisture within these masonry walls. We also tend to get efflorescence on these walls over time because water that dries out of the masonry walls carries salts with it. The salts may come from the mortar or they may come from minerals in the soil, but the point is we get salt on the walls and these salt deposits or efflorescence are from evaporation of that water and that efflorescence will attract more water which will try to dilute those salt concentrations and we get something called spalling which is essentially a structural deterioration of the masonry walls due to osmosis or osmotic pressures so we want to avoid that at all costs since this can really damage our old masonry walls. We get the same process occurring in the slab where moisture wicks up through the porous concrete which can cause efflorescence to form since plastic vapor barriers weren't really installed underneath these older slabs and in general you'll likely notice some dampness in the slab or an overall mustiness in the basement. Moisture in the slab also wicks up through the wooden components like a straw and we can get a lot of damage at the base of the embedded posts if we go to insulate the floor without addressing the moisture issue at this location. Moving up the wall, we can also run into some issues as well if we go to insulate between the studs without addressing bulk water. Now in this assembly we have some board sheathing with tar paper, beveled clapboard siding, and plaster and lath. Usually what happens is that the plaster and lath is either removed and the cavities are filled with insulation bats or spray foam, or the lath and plaster is kept in place and a hole is bored in the wall to fill the wall cavity with blown in insulation and if we go to insulate a wall in this way and there's moisture present if there's a leak in the wall where water concentrates at you're going to get rot over time because insulation slows the flow of heat through the wall assembly keeping the walls wetter for longer and you may notice damp spots behind your plaster and lath or moldy or musty smells and the walls rot out relatively quickly another issue especially in colder climates is that we get warm moist air diffusing through the walls to the exterior 
interior because moisture moves from warm to cold and from higher concentrations to lower concentrations, and we can get condensation on the back side of the sheathing. And that condensation doesn't dry out quickly enough because we've insulated the wall and it rots out the wood sheathing. You may notice that your paint is falling off the siding, and that's an early indicator of problems. And so what we need to do is that we need to address moisture in these walls before ever insulating or retrofitting the walls with insulation, while taking into account air leakage which can deposit moisture as well as vapor diffusion. At the roof here, we have an uninsulated, unvented attic space. It's part of the conditioned space because heat is allowed to migrate into this space, and so we don't want to change the dynamics of this roof too much unless we're able to address it properly. So we want to make sure it stays a conditioned roof so it functions how it's functioned for the last hundred years. Let's say we wanted to convert this to a vented roof, we added soffit vents and a ridge vent here, and we go to insulate at the ceiling level, we run the risk of actually worsening potential moisture problems. Now you might be thinking, well, the roof is vented, why would we have moisture problems? In colder climates, vented roofs are only effective at venting moisture in poorly insulated attics. Well, why is that? When we have warm, moist air diffusing or leaking through the ceiling into the attic, and we have cold, humid air coming in through the soffit vents, that cold air can't hold on to much moisture. So when we get that moist air diffusing or leaking into the insulated, vented attic space, there isn't significant heat loss from the building to actually warm up the incoming cold air to carry the moisture out of the roof assembly. So we can actually get condensation on the underside of the roof structure, increasing the moisture content in the framing. And you might notice your shingles blowing off from wet sheathing, so we need to be really careful about how we address this roof condition. Now there are ways to design a successful vented attic for a roof assembly like this, but we're not going to do that here. So how do we go about navigating all these decisions? Well, let's start at the foundation first. The foundation in the basement is where all the water will end up. It's the most challenged by water, apart from maybe the roof, so it's a good idea to start here. So what exactly can we do in this condition to prevent bulk water from getting inside, and what can we do to reduce the amount of water being absorbed into these masonry basement walls? First, we need to address exterior drainage as best as possible, and limit the amount of surface water from becoming subsurface water and groundwater around the foundation that could make its way inside. We want to direct water away from the building as efficiently as possible, get the water away from your building, this is absolutely critical. In some complicated sites, this can involve installing a shallow French drain system around the perimeter of the foundation, correcting the grade, and installing an impervious surface to divert water away from the basement, and to avoid saturating the adjacent soils, and so any water that finds a path underneath here will be directed to the French drain. If we're in a climate where we have a substantial frost depth, we can actually install a horizontal rigid insulation skirt around the perimeter of the foundation to warm the ground temperatures and keep them stable and prevent those cold temperatures from reaching the soils around the foundation. Then we need to address water that finds a path to the interior, and so we need a new interior perimeter drainage tile to be installed around the footings and below the slab and discharged to a sump pump or multiple sump pumps with backup batteries because usually we can't drain water out of basements without some sort of pump system, and we'll need to excavate around the perimeter of the slab to access this, which will be patched later on. Then we want to install a taped dimple mat, and what this dimple mat does is that it breaks capillary continuity between the damp masonry walls and the interior. It provides a drainage space for water to drain down to the new interior perimeter drain, and it provides a vapor barrier and air barrier, so any moisture migrating out of the masonry walls can't evaporate, which prevents efflorescence and spalling that could damage the wall here. So there's actually a lot of benefits to installing this dimple mat. It also allows us to insulate the framed walls with whatever strategy that we want, and so it opens up a lot of possibilities for retrofits if we're able to install this dimple mat, because any water that happens to get inside is just drained out. It's not going to get into the framed wall assembly and cause rot. At the slab, we have several options that we can use to address moisture. If we're dealing with especially wet conditions, installing an additional dimple mat at the floor level is highly recommended for the same reasons that we'd install the dimple mat on the basement walls. We want to prevent moisture from wicking inside. We want to equalize vapor pressure so that we don't get any additional moisture making its way to the interior, and we want to keep our interior finishes nice and dry, so this dimple mat strategy can be used on the walls and on the slab. It's also better than sealing the slab with an impermeable paint or epoxy, because that eventually wears off or fails over time if we have extremely wet conditions. So the dimple mat at the floor needs to be air sealed to the dimple mat at the walls, since this is acting as an air barrier as well, and sealed at every single joint and seam. Now at our wood components that are in direct contact with the slab or embedded in the slab, where we don't have a capillary break, we need to protect the wood from rotting out at these locations. Sometimes this means retrofitting a capillary break at these locations, or in more complicated situations, installing borate plug injections at the embedded ends to reduce the chances of rot at these locations. Borate salts have long been 
been used to deter insects that burrow into wood. It also inhibits the growth of rot fungi and mold, and so it's very beneficial in these situations where we have embedded wood components that are exposed to a lot of moisture. It also helps to drive out any moisture that gets inside. So these borate plugs are very important in wood framing that's in contact with wet masonry or other components that will wick water into the wood. We also want to install these borate plugs at the top of the wall where the wood framing meets the masonry wall since we don't have a capillary break here. At the framed wall assembly, we have a lot of options at our disposal, but primarily we need to prevent bulk water from getting inside, and if it does get inside, we need to allow it to drain and dry out. We also need to prevent condensation on the backside of the sheathing that could end up rotting out the wall assembly. So depending on how much access you have to the wall assembly and what your retrofit budget allows for, there's a lot of options at our disposal that can work to address these framed walls. The best option is to remove the existing cladding and install a new weather-resistive barrier, preferably a fluid-applied or self-adhered system so we get a monolithic water and air control layer that's bonded to the sheathing. We may need to install an additional layer of sheathing to bridge those gaps, but the point is we want a monolithic water and air barrier on the outside of the assembly. And then we want to install new cladding or reinstall the existing cladding over a rain screen to provide a ventilated drainage space so any water that gets behind the cladding just drains out and dries. This could be in the form of furring strips or 3D entangled mesh. It also allows the sheathing to dry out more easily through the weather barrier. We may also want to consider installing a layer of rigid insulation outboard to prevent condensation in those colder climates and to improve the energy efficiency and durability of the wall assembly. If we're unable to do that, our other option is to install a taped smart vapor retarder on the interior to prevent condensation, and that way we can also achieve an additional air barrier. It's also cheaper than installing a bunch of rigid insulation outboard. So we want to drain the walls and the cladding, we want to provide a new high quality weather resistive barrier, we want to air seal the walls, and we need some form of condensation control that doesn't inhibit the drying potential. Finally, at the roof assembly, we want to use a similar strategy to the walls. We need some form of condensation control here, whether it's rigid insulation installed outboard or a taped smart vapor retarder. Sometimes in these old attic spaces, it makes more sense to use a smart vapor retarder membrane due to the limited amount of insulation that can be installed on the exterior without impacting the aesthetics of the building, because if you have, for example, six inches of insulation installed outboard at the sheathing, it can add up and will make the fascia look a lot bigger since it needs to accommodate the depth of the rigid insulation and the shingles and the second layer of sheathing, and so it will add significant thickness to the roof structure, and that's not always desirable or even allowed by historic building restrictions. So sometimes just insulating the cavities and installing the smart vapor retarder over the rafters is the best option. So now that we have our game plan, let's go over the proposed solutions. So we're back here now with an updated detail at the basement foundation walls. As you can see, we've called out that dimple mat, which we've discussed earlier in the video, and that dimple mat is installed directly against the masonry foundation wall and taped, and it's lapped over the new interior drainage tile. The drainage tile is set in a crushed stone bed and wrapped in filter fabric to prevent sediment from clogging up the holes, and it's discharged to a couple of sump pumps with backup batteries just like we talked about. And that ensures that any water that leaks into this cavity from hydrostatic pressure can drain out, and any groundwater that happens to rise up during a period of heavy precipitation can be drained to the drainage tile and directed away from the home. The reason why we want backup batteries for the sump pumps is that these systems tend to fail when you need them the most. If there's a storm and the power goes out and you don't have a backup battery, the pump isn't going to work and your basement will flood. In order to install this drainage system and the dimple mat, we need to excavate a small portion of the existing slab around the perimeter, and then we come back later to patch it after everything is in place. And then at the top of the wall, we've terminated the dimple mat with flashing tape or a mold strip set in a bit of sealant, and then we're free to insulate the walls in whatever way that we want. In this particular detail, we've chosen an alternative strategy using mineral wool and a taped smart vapor retarder membrane so that we can have a continuous air barrier from the foundation walls all the way up to the framed walls and to the roof assembly. So here we have rigid mineral wool which has been installed against the dimple mat, rigid mineral wool bats within the framed wall cavities, and then the smart vapor retarder membrane which has been stapled to the studs and taped to the slab and extends all the way to the top of the wall and up onto the joists and onto the framed walls above. Now there's a trick that we use to accomplish this detail. We have to remove the floorboards at this location to access the top of the joists and tape around them, but we have a smaller piece of that smart vapor retarder membrane that's cut at each joist and laps over to bridge the connection and is taped to the lower section of the membrane. We also need to tape around each floor joist penetration since these are locations where air leakage can occur. Now, the smart vapor control layer will prevent vapor from diffusing from the inside outwards but allow moisture to dry out of the cavity to the interior if conditions get wet or humid inside 
inside the framed cavity, and that's the real benefit of the Smart Vapor Retarder. It prevents condensation, but allows the walls to dry out if they get wet, unlike standard polyethylene, and it can act as a substitute for taped rigid insulation or closed cell spray foam in terms of condensation control. And it allows us to use air and vapor permeable insulation types in isolation, like mineral wool. For those who are wondering, these Smart Vapor Retarders open up in permeance based on relative humidity. Then, we've created an airtight service cavity with 2x3 furring strips, spaced at 16 inches on center, and that allows us to install electrical penetrations and run conduit fairly easily without violating the integrity of the air barrier. If we need to make a penetration in the membrane, it can be taped, but overall this reduces any potential air leakage into the cavity that could cause convective looping. Back to the top of the wall here, we have our framing that's bearing directly on the masonry walls without a capillary break, so that means moisture can wick up into our framing components here. Now if we insulated this location haphazardly, we can run into some moisture issues, so what we've hauled out here are some borate rod injections which we talked about briefly a little earlier, but these borate plugs will help to prevent the growth of mold and rot fungi, as well as deter insects, and helps to dry out any moisture that wicks into the wood. Essentially what happens is that the borate salts will dissolve when exposed to wet conditions, driving moisture out of the framing as they leach into the wood and helping to preserve it. Now instead of insulating with rigid foam or spray foam here, we just have some rigid mineral wool and a mineral wool bat, and that allows moisture to easily dry out of the assembly through the smart vapor retarder, unlike rigid foam or spray foam in which the moisture would get trapped and potentially cause rot issues because it's both air and vapor impermeable. Mineral wool allows for drying and it also is an approved fire blocking material, so we can just use this as our required fire blocking here. And then, as I mentioned, the smart vapor retarder extends up the exterior wall, and then we can reinstall the subfloor boards if they're in good condition. We can even add an additional layer of subfloor if there's concerns about the integrity of the existing subfloor at these locations. Over here on the exterior side of the wall, we've called out some new zip system sheathing, which is essentially a board of OSB with an integrated waterproof coating, and this zip sheathing will be serving as our water and air control layer in the assembly. This can be installed directly over the board sheathing if it's in good condition, but if the board sheathing is questionable or you're seeing evidence of rot, it needs to be removed and you'd install the zip sheathing directly over the studs, but if it's in decent condition, there's no need to really remove it. You can just install the zip sheathing right over it, as long as you're using slightly larger fasteners so you can get that minimum in into the studs. Then we want to flash the zip sheathing to the masonry wall with a fluid applied flashing, in this case zip liquid flash, and this liquid flashing allows us to have a monolithic transition from the zip sheathing to the underside of the board sheathing and onto the face of the masonry. The liquid flash will be compatible with all of these materials, whereas a flashing tape will have a difficult time bonding to masonry, especially if it's a rough surface. If the masonry is in good condition, you can actually use a primed flashing tape that's compatible with the masonry, such as the Tescon Vana tape from Proclima or Siga Fentrum tape, but but the fluid applied flashing at this location makes a lot of sense, it's simpler to install, you don't need to mess around with primers, it's compatible, and it can be installed in damp conditions, so this liquid flash makes a lot of sense at this location. Then installed over that we have a Z flashing or base flashing with a drip edge that's been flashed to the zip sheathing, and that just kicks any water that drains behind the cladding away from the building. It won't get drawn to the masonry walls or to the sill plate from surface tension. We want to kick that water away because it can end up saturating the masonry at this location, and that water can get wicked into the wood components up here, so we want to direct water away from that masonry wall. Then we've installed our new beveled lap siding over a 3 8 of an inch entangled mesh rain screen, and this entangled mesh not only provides a drainage space but allows for ventilation, as it's large enough to get consistent airflow behind the cladding to get convective air drying, but 3 8 of an inch to a half inch gap is ideal because we can get a combination of airflow and drainage. The entangled mesh also won't rot away since it's made from high density polyethylene, which is beneficial in a wet climate or coastal climate where wood furring strips could deteriorate over time, so entangled mesh strips like this make a lot of sense. Back to the interior side of the wall, we have mineral wool bats that we're calling out within the stud cavities. You could also use blown-in cellulose, fiberglass, you could use wood fiber, but basically we're looking for something that's vapor permeable so that our wall assembly can dry to the interior or to the exterior, and of course we're preventing air leakage and condensation with our smart vapor retarder membrane on the interior, and taping those joints so it's airtight and prevents any kind of convective looping that could deposit moisture into the cavities. If we do a good job about air sealing the membrane and air sealing the zip sheathing, we're not going to have any air leakage issues here. We're also installing those same 2x3 furring strips for the airtight service cavity, and then the gypsum board can be attached directly to those. Now here at the roof, we're calling out a variation of a conditioned roof assembly. Conditioned roofs are unvented unless we're installing a vented roof over the conditioned roof, but what this means is that we're not introducing any outside air to vent out any moisture. What we're doing instead is that we're insulating within the rafter cavities and above the rafter cavities so that the attic is contained within the conditioned space. For this specific roof, we're dealing with existing 2x6 rafters, and one issue that we come across is that 
this doesn't allow for a lot of insulation to be installed within the rafter space. We don't want to install spray foam in this roof assembly because if there's a leak in this roof, it can end up trapping that water and rotting out the sheathing and framing. Spray foam can also crack if there's expansion and contraction of the framing components, which could result in condensation from air leakage. So we're facing several issues here as far as the depth of the rafter cavities, what types of insulation that we can specify, and the energy code requirements. We can't install too much insulation outboard of the existing sheathing because that would throw off the overall depth of the fascia. If we had more insulation installed outboard, we'd need to accommodate that in our design, otherwise we'd have a super deep fascia if we installed the majority of the insulation outboard. There are ways to accommodate this, but for a simple renovation, like this, it's not really that feasible. So what are we doing in this roof assembly? How are we meeting energy codes? And how are we controlling condensation? So we're doing a few things here. So let's first talk about how we're dealing with water and air leakage. We have a new cedar shake roof that's being installed over Cedar Breather, which is an entangled mesh product that basically allows any water that gets behind the wood shingles to drain out and dry so that it doesn't saturate and deteriorate the cedar shakes. Then installed underneath that, we have a self-adhered vapor permeable underlayment like Proclima's Adhero 3000 on a 5 8 of an inch CDX plywood sheathing, and that will provide a very robust water and air control layer on the outside, so any water that gets behind here won't get underneath any laps or seams and leak inside. That underlayment is essentially bonded to the sheathing, and if there is any moisture present, it can dry out because the underlayment is vapor permeable. That underlayment is flashed to the fascia and the drip edge, and everything is shingle lapped so we don't get any water in our framing. Then we have 2 inches of polyisocyanurate insulation, which is a rigid foam product, and it's roughly R6 per inch, and what this polyiso does is that it provides a thermal break between the roof sheathing and the exterior environment so that conditions stay a little bit more stable. It's providing a higher R value outboard and it reduces the necessary insulation buildup on the interior which could encroach on the attic space and potentially cause issues as far as maintaining thermal control continuity within the rafter space. Then installed under the poly ISO we have taped zip sheathing which acts as our air barrier over the existing board sheathing and it provides a nice stable substrate for the installation of the poly ISO and the roofing materials above. It provides a needed air barrier at this location to prevent convective looping that could deposit moisture into the roof assembly and cause deterioration or rot, and it provides some additional rigidity and strength to the roof structure. Obviously you'll want to confirm this with your structural engineer, but here we're using the zip sheathing primarily as an air barrier and as a more uniform substrate over the existing board sheathing. If the board sheathing is in bad condition, just remove it and install the zip sheathing right over the rafters. Here we have our existing 2x6 rafters which have been insulated with an R23 Rockwool Comfort Bat. As we mentioned before, that R23 isn't nearly enough to meet code, which is why we have that additional poly ISO installed outboard. And then installed inboard of the rafters, we have that taped smart vapor retarder with some joist extensions. Now what do these do? Well, we need to continue that taped smart vapor retarder membrane that was installed at the walls, and we need to extend it up onto the rafters, taping all of the seams, and that will provide our continuous air barrier and vapor control layer, because that two inches of poly ISO isn't enough to prevent condensation in this colder climate. We also have some joist extensions, which are these two by nailers that get fastened through into the rafters. And these are insulated to bolster the R value of the assembly to help us meet code requirements in this climate, so we can install an additional R15 rock wool bat that can be left exposed in this unfinished attic. At the connection between the roof framing and the exterior walls, we're sealing the connection with a fluid applied joint and seam filler to prevent air leakage at this location and to prevent bugs from getting inside. There's several manufacturers who make joint filler products, but Prosico's joint and seam filler is an excellent option. It's fiber reinforced, so it will allow for some movement in the frame joints, whether it's from general building movement or expansion and contraction of the wood framing, and if there's larger voids in the framing, you can install backer rod and then come back with the joint and seam filler to fill in the rest of that gap so that air doesn't leak through. We're terminating that zip sheathing short at the top plate, we're not extending it up and over, and so we need that additional air seal at the top here to prevent air leakage that could deposit moisture into our building envelope. So we want to make sure that we have a continuous air seal on the exterior, and we want an air seal on the interior as well to prevent convective looping and condensation on the backside of our sheathing materials. So the total R value of the roof assembly here, from the poly ISO down to the insulated joist extensions, is roughly R50. Now is that an effective R50? No, but that thermal break on the exterior is providing a lot of benefits that we wouldn't normally get if we just insulated the cavities. If you're looking for a complete guide on how to remodel your old home properly, get my moisture management guide to residential remodels where we discuss how to control moisture and safely insulate a wide range of existing building conditions. That's only available at asiri-designs.com com slash shop. Links will be in the description below. And we've got over 150 free building science articles that are available to you as well, many of which cover topics that we discussed in this video, except at even greater depth. Make sure to give this video a like if you haven't already, and subscribe for more weekly building science content. For now, good luck with your projects. Cheers.